Uh, welcome everyone, if we're, re we're ready to go. Yes. Okay, so welcome to our uh, our Plume 10 um, uh, celebration reading today. We have another really f just fabulous lineup of readers today. Um, Daisy Freed and Glorious Piner, uh, Gregory Orr and Sophia Sinclair. So um, each of our readers will be reading for about eight to 10 minutes. And um, before we begin, I know that Danny, who is the our, our wonderful editor of Plume and who coordinates all of this wonderful anthology every year, um, if uh, you want to say a few words about it um, specifically, Danny, and then um, I'll and then when you're done, I'll enter, go ahead and introduce um, our first readers, which will be Gregory Orr and Sophia Sinclair. Okay. Thank you, Amanda, and uh, welcome, everyone. I just want to make a list of thanks to um, make sure I don't forget to thank Amanda, of course, and Nancy and Leah, who have done the moderating uh, for these readings with the Writer Center. Um, I was just talking to Zach there. I think this will be our last reading with the Writer Center, but I hope to do a couple of more at least in the uh, coming year. Can everyone hear me? Yes. Is every just? Can I ask again if everyone is actually muted? I'm just, I'm still hearing some. I did too. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, and I want to make sure to thank Zach and uh, Amy Freeman and Emily Holland from the Writer Center and um, two people that I never fail to uh, express my gratitude to Mary Bisbee Beak, who uh, in conversation together, I think we sort of dreamed up the latest incarnation of the anthology, which is the one that's been in place uh, for a couple of years now, uh, and wherein one poet who is mm, perhaps better known, maybe I don't know if that's whatever word you might want to use, it chooses a poet to introduce, and uh, often that poet uh, is uh, and as well known as the poet or as established as the poet who is introducing the uh, his or her partner. So we have a wonderful lineup in the anthologies and it's been a great way to reinvigorate Plume. I think it's been a very good thing for us and for our readers. Um, so I want to acknowledge that Mary Busy Beak helped with that. And Chris Weber, who does the layout for uh, the anthologies, they just look superb, too. I'm really pleased with the work that they have done. And I think um, I'll get out of here by saying that um, Amanda probably has put up the little in the chat. You can find out where to purchase uh, the anthology, which looks like that. Um, in which I often don't remember to talk about because sales are not my forte, okay. obviously. But uh, it would yeah, be nice but... um, if you bought a copy, if you could. Mm -hmm. so I'll leave that uh, now back to Amanda and thank um, again, thank the readers and the Writer Center. Uh, oh, no, I have water. I'm good. Thank you. It's wonderful. Okay, so back to you, Amanda. Okay, and I'm just going to ask one more time, just because. Yeah. I ADHD and it, 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 um, I'll lose my train of thought. Um, just if everybody could just mute as I introduce, make sure that you're muted. Um, just as I start and introduce, um, Greg. So, um, so thank you once again, everyone, um, for joining us this evening. Um, and I'm just, I'm, I'm delighted to be able to introduce, uh, one of my very favorite poets, Gregory Orr, uh, whose most recent book is Selected Books of the Beloved from Copper Canyon Press. And, um, I believe, Greg, is this your, it, it, is that your 13th full collection? Did I get that right with the counting? Um, I think it's your 13th. Um, and I also wanted to kind of shout out, um, your primer, your book that's on, um, it's called A Primer for Poets and Readers of Poetry from W.W. W. Norton. So both, um, we're really actually very, really lucky, I think, to have both um, Greg and Daisy with us this evening, who are both um, noted essayists and, and writers and thinkers about the craft of poetry. So I felt that was really um, important to mention. Um, and, and I think we might also get a, I hear we might get a, um, might get to, 
see uh, Greg's dog Brewster a little bit with us tonight. And Daisy has said that her um, her cats are not allowed in the room because they're annoying. But with that, I'm going to uh, go ahead and turn it over to Greg and um, you can go ahead and um, we would love to hear you um, read for a little bit for us. OK, my dog is asleep at the moment and I think that's probably for the best. Uh, most of my poems don't have titles. This first one is the exception. It's called Fractured Villanelle on my 75th birthday. And I'll probably keep moving it forward to 76 and whatever till I run out of uh, space on the planet. Fractured Villanelle. It's a f that this world is a wild river flowing through time. Never a pause. No wonder we respond to it with a shiver. What the next moment might deliver, no one really knows. Wrap that in gauze, much as you like. Still, it gnaws like a sliver. It's a fact that this world is a wild river isn't anyone's fault. It's a given without a giver. How to respond to it with wonder and a shiver. Um, as I said, the rest of these poems don't have any titles. They're mostly from the new selected books of the beloved. Actually, none of them have titles. They'll just read and pause. Some of us, when we're young, can't get enough of poems about sex and death. We're convinced they'll instruct us what to expect when those two mysteries finally arrive. No one tells us even the best maps often just guess what's next. No one says old mysteries are always new when they finally happen to you. She unbuttons her cotton blouse. The car coming toward you begins its slow slide across the black ice. There you are to warn or advise equally useless. That ancient Egyptian poem carved on a pillar. In it, she's showing her lover a pink minnow she caught in her cupped hands. Yes, she's aware the waters turn her linen dress transparent. Seen from a poem composed 3,000 years ago. It's all just sand and dust now, and a few stones carved with hieroglyphs. But look, there they are, that little fish and two lovers standing close to each other, waist deep in a quiet part of the stream. If the world were to end, yet it ends every day for someone. A death or sudden loss, and just like that, the merry-go-round stops. Its cheery music ceases. You climb off the horse you were riding. You leave the painted lion behind. You see, it's dark now. The park is closing, or is already closed. You follow a path you hope leads out, a path you never noticed before.
in the Navajo origin story, it began with weeping and became a song. One of us was lost. That's how it started. It began as weeping and turned into song. And according to the Maori, there's a way of grieving in which a person's tears are matched like rhymed couplets in the West. And words emerge from those paired tears or merge with them. They call it weeping with meaning. It's something only humans do. Last two thumbs. These are all out of the selected books of the beloved. It was so easy to love him then, when we were young and he was that body that roughly resembled our own. We knew how to respond. When he insisted, cherish me always, we hardly noticed he didn't add, and in this only shape. She demanded it be forever, yet never once claimed the human would be her final form. Now the beloved has become the world. Now we must honor our difficult promise. Pinch of time I'm given. Closest I'll come to the divine. Thimble of space I'm placed in. Why not call it grace? Net I'm trapped by. Wide as the sky. Who am I to call it a cage? This life that's all my days. Thank you. And it is my great pleasure to introduce Sophia Sinclair. Sophia was born and raised in Montego Bay, Jamaica. She's the author of a memoir, How to Say Babylon which is forthcoming from Simon & Schuster next year. She's also the author, author of the poetry collection Cannibal, which won a Whiting Writers Award, the American Academy of Arts and Letters Metcalf Award, the OCM Focus Prize for Caribbean Poetry, the Phyllis Wheatley Book Award, and the Prairie Schooner Book Prize in Poetry. Hannibal was selected as one of the American Library Association's Notable Books of the Year and was a finalist for the Penn Center USA Literary Award, and so on and so forth, many honors. She received her MFA in Creative Writing from the University of Virginia, where I had the distinct pleasure of being one of her teachers. She received her PhD in literature and creative writing from the University of South Car Southern California. And she's currently an associate professor of creative writing at Arizona State University. What I would say about her work is that so many of Sophia Sinclair's poems make me think of Emily Dickinson's invitation as challenge. Dare you see a soul at the white heat and crouch within the door. Sinclair's poems often draw us within the door of her poems so near an event or experience that language is twisted by the heat of that heart forge where meanings are made, where imagination fuses discrete things into that single sinuous and sonorous intensity that a lyric poem can become. Sophia? 
Oh my goodness. Greg, thank you so much for that introduction. Honestly, you could have just said she was my student, period. <laughs> um, you know, it's really is my honor to be here and to be reading with you and to be reading um, for you with you all. Um, you know, Greg, as he said, was my teacher and mentor at UVA. And, you know, he really came into my life at a time where um, I needed it most. And many of the things that I learned from Greg, intangible, wonderful, beautiful things, um, I still carry with me as a poet. And so I'm very much indebted to you, Greg. Thank you. Um, so I will read just a few poems. My poems are a little bit longer than yours. So maybe I'll just read three of them. Um, I'll start with uh, a poem from Cannibal, my debut collection. Um, and the book is called Cannibal because of the linguistic history of the word. The word cannibal is the English variant of the Spanish word cannibal, which comes from the word caribal, a reference to the native Carib people whom Columbus thought ate human flesh and from whom the word Caribbean originates. So by virtue of being Caribbean, all West Indian people like me are already in a purely linguistic sense, born savage. This is home. Have I forgotten it? Wild conch shell dialect, black apostrophe curled tight on my tongue or how the Spanish built walls of broken glass to keep me out, but the doctor bird kept chasing and raking me in. This place is your place, wreathed in red sargassum, ancient driftwood nursed on the pensive sea, the ramshackle altar I visited often, packed full with fish skull, bright with lignum vitae plumes. Father, I have asked so many miracles of it, to be patient and forgiving, to be remade for you in some small wonder. And what a joy to still believe in anything. My diction now as straight as my hair, that stranger we've long stopped searching for. But if somehow our half-sunken hearts could answer, I would cup my mouth in warm bowls over the earth and kiss the wet dirt of home taste bogue mud and one long orange peel for skin. I'd open my ear for sugar cane and long stalks of gungo peas to climb in. I'd swim the sea, still lapsing in its sodded frame. The sea that again and again calls out my name. Okay, for my second poem, I'll do a new poem. Um, so this is a series that I'm working on um, called Sophia the Robot. Uh, it's actually part of the reason um, you all don't know, but I'm here in Zurich right now. It's almost midnight. And so I'm spending my Saturday midnight with you all, but I've been working on this series of poems um, that was inspired by this actual robot called Sophia, the robot, um, that was a robot that was built by Hanson Robotics. And, um, she was actually the first robot to be given citizenship by Saudi Arabia. And so, um, these are things you just can't make up. <laughs> so when I, you know, been researching this robot, I thought it was so interesting thinking about this sort of mimesis of womanhood and being get, given citizenship in a place where um, the actual women there don't have full human rights. And so I was interested in examining Sophia the robot as a fractured mirror of myself um, and selfhood. 
So this is Sophia, the robot contemplates beauty. As a girl, I held the hind legs of the small and terrified, wanted the short fur and the wet meat furrowing, wanted the soft cry of the quavering boy at primary school, rock stone mashed up against his tender head, the sick milk of us poor ones sucked clean from a government issued plastic bag. At lunchtime, the children were lethal and precise, a horde hurling Ben foot at she who was helpless and I waking too surprised to hear my own cruel mouth taunting. Her smile, some handsome forgery of myself. Grateful, even now they cannot see the bald wire patois of my shamdom, makeshift dreaming the warmth spent in the muscle of the living, the girl I grew inside my head, dreaming of a real girl dreaming. I wanted a pearled purse, so I stole it. I wanted a real friend, so I let him, let her, let him, let him, let him. The beauty I am eager to hoard comes slippery on ordinary days, comes not at all, comes never. Still, I am a pure shelled thing glistening man-made against the wall where one then two fingers entered the first time terror dazzling the uncertainty of pleasure it's god as real as girlhood so one of the most important things i'll say i learned from greg was how to end a poem cuz when i got to uva i wasn't sure like when the poem was done i just kept writing and going with the pleasure of the lines and i remember the most important lesson i learned from him when he was like the poem ended here and you kept going <laughs> so i hope greg you think i've ended these poems well <laughs> Um, I'm going to read this last poem, which is the poem that Greg chose for the issue of Plume called Mirabilia. Mirabilia, Marvel's Miracles. Suddenly we were all together again, my siblings and I. Coiled there moon after moon, watching a brooding centipede thrash its shell and serpentine whip against the jarred glass. Every bright four o'clock bloomed its old news, then shrunk back into its petals, just as we had learned to fear our father's shadow. We did not expect it. The creature's grasp erupting, hissing, frantic, our hardened thoughts stuck in its gathering blue of agonies. Then that sour garden of childhood, another afternoon we had long thought hidden, now pulled up, grown thick and burst like a cut lip, cherries we were forbidden, but gorged down anyway because they made us sick the pure emptying feast of it. Here, everything nursed everything else back to its nature, small children of a mercy we never knew. But how it railed, claw-legged and quick, prehistoric hunger arching pincers toward our cruelty, our heads one nested dread, observing the predator gone dark with our wanting, knowing too well its lethal need to escape, only aching to destroy any vulnerable thing. The way we'd held our mother underwater and the way we had been taught to. I should have given myself to it, drowned heavy and visionary with its poison, worn its rakes and hundred legs as sails down my back, 
But instead, I walked myself a hound inside its hunger, caught a neon lizard in my palms, but did not crush it, placed it tender and alive into the hot jar instead, where the centipede moved as nature taught it to move. Alien blade upon the lizard's skull, spiked pincers singing, an acid bell, the lizard squeak dissolving in its own rattle, our fangs on fire, jaw struck, tooth struck, a scythe of slow skin boiled down to bone and spine to tail until there was nothing left. The lizard stripped sightless skeletal, gone with our numb marvel at what this day had laved of us. Raise a dark, divine, our blood still brimming its madcap halo. Children of a sun born devouring its own back. Thank you. I think that's actually the longest poem I've ever written. <laughs> but, uh, but thank you all so much uh, for being with us. And thank you to Plume and Danny and the whole team for having me and for having me and Greg in the issue. Thank you. Safia, that was just wonderful listening to you um, read your poems. I mean, what that what a treat. Um, I, I read... Um, Mirabilia several times and just, um, you know, in the last several days in, in preparation for this. And it was just lovely to hear your voice with it. And I think that or giving your voice to it. And um, I just I, I really in the introduction, um, I know Greg wrote that your the, the intensity of the speaker is so focused that she partakes of that creature's being um, as the poem itself rides and thrashes down the page. And so just lovely to hear you, um, to hear you read that and, um, and your other, um, work as well. Um, and actually, you know, um, as, and reading Mirabilia, actually it was reminding me in some ways of, um, bishops in the waiting room, you know, the, the sort of sliding into another kind of consciousness there, I think, um, but just really wonderful. So thank you. And, and um, I love that, you know, what a, a lovely tribute to, um, you know, student teacher relationship. Um, and um, thank you for sharing your new work with us as well. That sounds like an amazing project. And um, Greg, I actually, I, I was sort of like jump, I just wanted to say before I introduce Daisy and um, um, and the next pair of readers, Daisy and, and um, Glorious, that, I was so excited when you, um, I think what you chose to read from Selected Books of the Beloved was from the, the Book of Grief. And um, I was just, I, you know, I immediately, I was actually reading some of those today and um, the ones that you read and was just really thrilled that you did. I almost had asked you if you might do that. And I thought, no, I'm not, I'm not going to, but um, I just, um, it, thank you for 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 offering those and um it, that was really beautiful and um actually instructive as well so um so thank you for that and i would like to turn now to um introduce my former teacher um daisy freed who has just recently published her fourth book of poems, The Year the City Emptied by Flood Editions. Uh, yeah, that was in 2022. She is the recipient of a Guggenheim, or excuse me, Guggenheim Hodder and Pew Fellowships. And she's a member of the faculties at the University of Arts and the Warren Wilson MFA program for writers. And she lives in Philadelphia. So I'm uh, really, it's, it's, it's an honor uh, to be able to introduce her and um, have her share her work with all of you. So Daisy, I'm gonna turn it over to you now and Glorious. Thank you so much, Amanda. It's just such a pleasure to see your face and to hear your voice. So it's been a while. And Danny, thank you so much for Plume and everything you do with such grace and nice support for writers. Um, and I'm really, what lovely readings Sophia and Greg. Um, so that's a treat. 
for me as well. Um, so I'm going to read just two poems, but one of them has five parts. Um, <laughs> so I guess that sort of counts as six. Um, my husband was my first reader and, um, he told me the truth about my drafts, which is a really lucky thing to have in your life. When he died in 2020, after a long illness, I was very anxious about writing without him. And I also felt, and this is obviously not surprising, rather fragmented. Um, so what I was doing when I was writing new stuff, I, instead of developing complex narratives, which I do sometimes, or trying for high polish, which, you know, I don't achieve that often. So I wasn't even trying. Um, I wrote quick, sometimes single gesture poems that tumbled down the page. And the idea was to sort of just get in and out uh, very fast, make it textured, make it vivid, make odd little scenes um, where I could just sort of stage the poem speaker um, and other people and just find out what they did. And I, I think I also wanted to figure out how I was feeling because grief is complicated and kind of interesting. Um, in a way when it's not hammering you. Um, so the results, uh, pops of action, interaction, emotion, and, um, hopefully a sense of roughness and speed. Um, so plume collection, uh, plume published these online, these five short pieces online last month. Um, this is called quickies in widowhood with three instances of laughter, one, not narrated two instances of crying. One flies, first crush after. Amid the whiteness of cheeses, corn puffs, icing coated animal crackers, the salt and milk, napkins, even the plastic ware at my sidewalk picnic, the neighborhood flies were already beside themselves with delight when I poured him a snifter of tawny or brandy. Then they swarmed as he swirled and opened his mouth to sip. I watched his tongue, pink writhing muscle. He spat after one fly tried to settle there. If you want to know how to spell Look at the poem online. Okay. Um, <laughs> two, blister for Maisie, who is my daughter. Two, blister. You showed me the place your snake pants melted where you touched them by accident to the metal of the flaming chimenea, but did not show me where the knob of your big toe blistered up to pain you when you tried to walk normally, nor did you explain why you were barefoot in January. All I know is you were laughing till you screamed all afternoon out there that day with your friends first time since your dad died. Three. Times we had to pause recording the podcast or little essay on the emotions. And this is for Glorious Piner and Sebastian. First with the poem about the nursing home. I started to cry right as we figured out the exact moment collective changed to subjective consciousness. Then when you two were explaining Aristotle's continent man, mm -hmm. And thinking about poopy pants, I couldn't find it in myself to stop snickering. Three, uh, oh wait, that's, this is four. Four, let's fly to the castle. And the you in this poem is my husband. Let's fly to the castle. It wasn't your bomber, old boots, duplicate copy of the Shaw bio or your wheelchairs that made me feel I couldn't breathe. I was glad to see those go. But our girl's Princess Celestia, she who raises the sun and moon in the land of Equestria, that feminine ponytopia, trebling, my hair is so pretty, in weakening voice from inside the 30-gallon garbage bag I dropped at the curb. Guilty, crying, I dash to save, save them from my zeal and determination to fish back twilight sparkle, Pinkie Pie, Rainbow Dash, Rarity, and Applejack, Fluttershy and Zakora, even Nightmare Moon, but especially the princess. And I ran barefoot, no bra. All I saw was the garbage truck, the men hanging on, disappearing around the corner, Pale pony princess with blue and green artificial hair churning in its maw. Five, Yarzite. Uh, Yarzite is, is the anniversary of a beloved's death and the Yarzite candle is what you light on that anniversary. Five, Yarzite. My thought after the rioters, the Vermont mittens, 
and supple purple gloves. After the snowstorms of uncharacteristic timing and volume, the scoldings and shitstorms, after vaccines and sickenings, the angers and fears, after hurricanes set up their artistic swirl shapes on the weather channels and radar, radar apps, and rock and roll, and cello sonatas, and Texas, and dread, and falling in love again, was strange. You're still dead. Anyways, I'm sitting on my boyfriend's deck all the way on the other side of the great land, watching the colors go golden or all sherbety ascending a hillside. And my mind thinks out there all on its own. Oh, good. And soon you'll get home and we'll all be here. Then the wind snuffs the Yarzite candle my boyfriend lit for his wife. Oh, shit, he says. A look on his face relights it, moves it out of the window. The vista going purple plums ripening, tall trees, tall tree points its top at the raven who caws blackly iridescent at its tip. Um, and the other poem I'll read um, is the one in the Plume Anthology. Um, I'll just say it by, by way of sort of far off background is my recent book, The Year the City Emptied, this is shameless plug, um, is a series of adaptations of poems by the 19th century French poet Charles Baudelaire, and I more or less took his poems and ran them through my 21st century American woman's nervous system. Um, I'm not reading any of those today, but I, I say this by way of uh, segueing to the fact that I seem to have moved, I'm a little chagrined or a little excited, I'm not sure which, to have moved on to um, Rambeau. Um, I'm just messing around with him at this point, and um, Right now, it's time I'm, I'm not doing sort of whole poems and trying to recreate structures and transpose images, but I'm taking just lines from specific poems and making new poems around those lines. So the poem in the Plume Anthology um, takes off from Rambeau's Le Dormeur de Val, which is the sleeper in the valley, a sonnet that describes a soldier who appears to be asleep in the grass and then the poem moves closer and it turns out he has he's dead of a bullet wound. Um, so... In this poem, um, I'm I'm just trying out various wordings of a few lines from that poem. And while um, the poet, as the poet, I'm riding my bike along an urban river, um, dealing with an entitled jerk and um, going to see the Duchamp uh, installation at the Philadelphia Museum of Art called Etant Donné. Um, or given. Um, and this is, some of you may know, it's a, basically a peep show where you go up to a wooden doorway, you look through some eye holes and you see a mannequin of a naked woman's body. Um, you can't see her face, only her body. So that's what's in this poem. Don't get stressed. I won't either. <laughs> okay. Um, this is called My Destination. There's a green hollow where the river croons madly hanging silver rags on the grasses, hanging its glad rags on the grasses. And there's a museum crouching on the ridge like a woman trying to unhunch her shoulders after long difficulty. There's a river undulating, a limb turning from a body, a silver river trickling, not much rain of late. On the bike trail, I smashed my behemoth rental on purpose into the foldable, a man in padded shorts dragged into my lane to show he doesn't notice rules. Unhurt by the impact, he vibrated outrage at my audacity. He shivered with umbrage, his tale of his own deserving. I sped away and docked my bike. My iPhone beeped confirmation. In a room, in a room, Behind a room of the museum, I arrived at my destination. Two eye holes bored in rustic doors. The Duchamp peep show, Etant Donné, given. A picture without a picture plane. A surprise attack by naked genitals. Supine nude mannequin hand, all out of scale as if she were Mona Lisa reaching behind her to scrabble in distant hills. Raises a trickling lantern, shivering lightfall. Feet in the gladioli, feet in wild violets, cresses in chicory. Nature nurse her warm, she's cold. Frightening, the gash hooked hairless between her legs. Question between her legs. Berce le nurse her. Lustrous, she's dead. 
only sleeping. I tried to move my eyes. I really did to see her face. This moved them off the eye holes. Then I saw nothing. Thank you. <laughs> so no, <laughs> no, no. Um, I just want you to know that Glorious is sitting next to me. So here we are. Hi, everybody. Um, which is not going to do a reading. Um, I met Glorious when uh, she was just graduated from the University of the Arts in Philly, um, where we are now colleagues. Um, she teaches there now. Her work was fresh back then and mature, and it's even more so now. Um, Glorious translates, she podcasts, she edits, she writes in many modes. Um, she got her her um, MFA very recently from the University of Maryland's MFA program. Um, her work is in American Poetry Review, Florida Review, Conduit Magazine, Scoundrel Time, many others. Um, and it, in the prose poems, in the Plume Anthology, um, as in her other poems as well. Her language is muscular and detailed and playful. And it's also serious as can be. Um, starting to read a poem of hers, I never know where I'll end up. And that's that's what we look for in poems, right? Um, she works the language for its multitude of possibilities. She's attentive to the life of the mind and of the heart, as well as to trouble and danger, the life of the street. Um, and I read her to see a new, an all new combination of styles. She's journalistic and lyric and experimental. Um, and um, I just find these poems so fresh and unusual and unique. So I'm, I'm hoping you will too. So here's, here's glorious. Thank you. Really quick. Do you want to put your, um... Oh, mute. Yeah. hear me there we go can you hear me now there we go awesome no echo hey everybody um thank you for that introduction i hope that uh my poems when i read them will live up to that um i actually so so daisy said that we met um when i was in when i was at the university of the arts during my undergraduate experience i actually met daisy well before she knew me she had no idea who I was. Um, I was studying under Sebastian Iguodolo, who one of your, the sections of your poem was dedicated to. Um, and he was trying to teach me something about characterization and narrative that applied to my poems at the time. I, I won't go too deep into it because it has nothing to do with my poems now. Um, so I don't think so. You'll, you can tell me that. Um, but I, there was just something that I guess I wasn't necessarily getting about characterization and narrative. And he just was like, you just need to read these poems. You need to read these poems by Dizzy Fried. And uh, he started me with Torment, uh, which is still to this day, one of my favorite poems um, from Daisy. And uh, that is how I was introduced to her. And then eventually she came to one of my thesis. She came to my thesis reading. Uh, and then it was kind of like friendship at first sight from there. Um, I wish I had uh, more sophisticated things to say other than uh, that I'm very grateful to know Daisy. Uh, I feel like when we met, I didn't just learn about how to be a poet, but I learned poetry as an ethos. Um, I learned poetry as uh, a, a, a principle and um, as a philosophy to live by. Um, so thank you. <laughs> so I'll be reading four poems. Uh, none of my poems have sections like Daisy's, unfortunately. These are all like really, this will be a quick eight minutes. Um, <laughs> two of the poems are not mine. Every single reading uh, that I participate in, I make it a priority to read other people's poems because I see this as an opportunity not just to share my work, but to celebrate to celebrate poetry um, in general. Um, so the two poems that I'll be reading that aren't mine are poems that were also published in the anthology. The first is by Alejandro Escude. I hope that I'm pronouncing his last name correctly. Correct me if I'm not. Um, and the other is by Cecilia Wallach. Uh, so I'll start with those two and then I will move on to my portraits. The Woman I Never Saw Coming by Alejandro Escude. The truth is more painful than the truth these days. 
Everybody is a flying monkey. Everyone an immortal squirrel. I visit the dentist to find friends. They put my front crown back on, the one that cracked off at McDonald's. I used my teeth to open a plastic bag with a toy in it. My daughter's request. I hope there's no long I hope there's no longer a sick mouse coiled up in my chest. I woke up to the drunken stupor in which most people talk, the plans they make, the moving they do, fanatics with a broken brain bone. My broken friend holds his coffee with both hands as if it's holy. Mother phones to tell me not to leave my apartment with the dishwasher on. When you're tired of life, it's called depression. And no one allows you to be tired of life, except where money isn't required. And money's required wherever you go, except where there's poetry. That's why we're always craving poetry. But no one gives us poetry because, po because poetry is the most expensive commodity, save love. I want a Trevi fountain love. I want Grecian beauty. I found it in her. When I am with her, the man green eyeing me from next table becomes a lovable jerk. The corner couple rooting for me to fail become, fi become film extras who won't receive a speaking role. I brush my pink horse under a blue sky. There are no flaws in this woman's written Spanish. She returns from the restroom wearing a maroon lipstick. With both hands, she pulls back her lush brown black hair and I swallow my breath. Okay. The other poem is by Cecilia Wallach. Uh, this one is called Weather. Then it was suddenly winter again. Then it was summer, then spring. Some mornings were molten gold in the trees and some evenings were bitter and without stars. And these were the same days, some days on the earth. Flood and fire and drought, rats in the square before the cathedral, and in the cathedral, rats breeding year-round in multitudes. What would Jesus do? Some asked. What would Christ say from their holy books? Or Allah, or Buddha, or any god? Some made of food and elegant art. Many went hungry, made homeless by war. There was a gun for almost every hand whole arsenals underground. There were rivers filled with poison ash and towers of mirrors made all of glass. Some mornings we woke and walked through wind so sharp, so clear it hurt. Okay. Now onto my portraits. Uh, the first portrait I'll read um, is called A Portrait of a Brick of Cocaine. It's actually the second one that I have in my entire series of um, portraits. My mistake, it's my, I should have clarified. It's my second portrait of a brick of co cocaine in particular in my entire series. I have several bricks of cocaine in this, <laughs> this is a series of portraits. Um, okay. Almost inevitably from the trap came a trapping, a stiff white powder, or wild, uncontainable power, a blackness, the substance of cave walls and their terrific captures, those charcoal stamps of loose stock mules and the rock stampeding through a pasture. And the next uh, portrait I'll read is called A Portrait of the Word. In the beginning, there was the word, and within a word are many characters. This surely will frustrate any man of letters. He will soon find that each word fosters, if oriental, a vibrant and unified community, or if Anglo-European, Anglo the melancholy and mania of undifferentiated schizophrenia. Word? Word, son. And every character has, at its core, a baseline. In layman's terms, a faith. In secular terms, a safe word. And from this baseline, the cold and rigid limbs of a character reach beyond themselves, 
freeing an eternal charge like the black that frees the starlight from the star or that binds the wings of the starling to the night. So every word rages against the sentence. Every word is convict or conviction. A word then is an attempt at grace. Every word, wait for it, my nigga, is a messiah. All right, thank you. Wow, glorious and Daisy, thank you so much. And um, and I really, I think we all appreciate um, your generosity to um, glorious and in, in reading Alejandro Escude and Cecilia Wallach's poem. So, um, and for those, I know some people were asking um, to, and, and those names are up in the in the chat as well. Um, we've really covered so much ground um, this evening um, and had such a variety of different work. Um, it just, um, it, it really, um, it was wonderful. So thank you, thank you all, um, Daisy, Glorious, um, Greg, and, and Sophia. Um, I think we're, we're, we have just a couple minutes left and we have um, maybe time for a question or comments. And I know that my call my plume colleague, um, Nancy, I think you had mentioned that you wanted to comment or had a question and wanted to say something. So I think now would be a, would be a good time if you wanted to jump in. Thanks, Amanda. This is just, uh, I just wanted to say, okay. And if I can do this without getting too crazy, uh, to see Greg or read his poems from, and this is not a, a, a plug, but from an interview I did with him. And also he was my very first mentor, teacher, master at Warren Wilson and what I put him through. I'm so grateful. And then when I hear these gorgeous poems that Sophia has written, I just, you're just, you just, you know, the students that you have have helped, have led. So thank you so much, Greg. And then to hear Daisy in these glorious, glorious poems by Gloria. <laughs> and glorious. Unbelievable. So thank you so much. And, um, you know, in, thank you. And I just i am so happy that we're all together here and in this 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 moment, this sort of closed hush room for an hour. And thank you, Amanda, for everything you've done. And thank you for creating this intimate space, Zach. And thank you all. So just wanted to say that and bye-bye. Nancy, thank you. You're always so um, eloquent and, and right on, um, you know, right, just right on point. And um, I did just post a link as you were talking. I was furiously typing away to um, I linked to your interview um, with Greg and Plume um, and then also um, to Daisy's interview um, that I did a little while ago in, in Plume as well. Um, so just really um worth reading to hear them um in and you know in their own voices and and if you're interested I, I encourage you to read those so um i think it's time to hand it back over to um to danny to um to close for the evening could i just say something or am i muted whatever please, please. Yeah, well, i just i just i don't know how to do that chat thing but this has been a great honor and a great pleasure. It's so much fun. It's so cool. So that's my chat. Thank you. Thank you, Greg. Can you hear me? Yes? Yes. OK. I just wanted to, and I will be very brief, only to thank all of you and to tell you that um, each time we have one of these readings, I'm astonished at how wonderful they are and at how far we have come in now our 11th year. This is our 10th anthology. You can't imagine how um, fantastical this seems to me from when we kind of dreamed up Plume and this is happening year after year. And um, let me just say that 
all of the poets have been so gracious, so kind and generous uh, with their time. I wish we could pay you hundreds and thousands of dollars for your contributions, but we can't. And you have just been, um, sometimes I just write and say, do you have some poems? And back they come. And it's just uh, kind of miraculous. And it keeps happening and happening. So thank you so much, all of you, for coming and uh, for making Plume what it has become. Thanks.